streaming in, but we're in Switzerland. We're under a legal obligation to start on time. So I'd like uh, just to spend one, two minutes uh, again to, first of all, uh, welcome you again to the second day. Um, and then once again, I'd like to thank the sponsors, uh, Google, Swisscom, Buller Group, EPFL, and Crowda and EcoCloud, research centers and projects. Also, of course, I want to highlight again the uh, fact that we have a job fair this afternoon. Uh, and these are the companies that will be there. Please go talk to these companies. And projects, um, they're always looking for talent. And we're delighted to have them here. So you seen yesterday, uh, the program was pretty packed. Uh, nothing's going to change about that today. So uh, we're going to start with a very uh, nice session that I'm delighted to have this morning with Nuria Oliver from Vodafone and the Data Pop Alliance, and then fo followed by Emmanuel Mogenet, who's the head of Google Research Europe. And so after they've given their talks, we just go for a very quick coffee break. Then Martin Yaki, the co-organizer, will give a talk. And then we'll have uh, Emmanuel and Nuria back on stage with Ed Bignon, who will join us. Uh, also, the new Vice President for Information Sciences, uh, Information Services uh, at EPFL, and uh, we'll, have, we'll have a chat on, um, on AI and society. Uh, then we'll go for, for lunch, and then uh, in the afternoon, we start by an exciting talk by uh, Anima Anand Kumar. She's with Amazon now, um, and she will talk about distributed deep learning on AWS. And then we have the rapid fire talk. So these are the short talks by the submissions that we got where we have all the advancing slides. So this will be great. At the same time, the job fair starts down there. And you'll see, as I mentioned yesterday, you'll see about 180 additional students stream in. These are from the ADA class, Applied Data Science. And they will have 60 posters up uh, to show off what they've done this semester. Uh, then we'll go for another coffee break, and uh, then we'll, we'll finish with the final session um, with Volkan Seber, Boy Faltings, and François Fleury. Good. So without much further ado, I'm now introducing Nuria Oliver. And while she sets up um, her computer, <laughs> let's do this real quick. Okay, is this on? Is this on? Almost on. Now it's on. Okay, so very delighted to have Nuria here. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, she's the first chief data scientist at the Pop, a da a Data Pop Alliance, and since January this year, she's been the uh, director of research in data science at Vodafone. Uh, before, she was eight years as scientific director at Telefonica. She spent seven years at Microsoft. Previously, did a PhD with Sandy Pentland at MIT. Um, she got numerous awards. Congrats again, on actually, on being IAAA Fellow 2017. Oh, uh, also in 2016, Fellow of the European Association of Artificial Intelligence, European Digital Woman Award of the Year, the Gaudi Grisol Award to Excellence in Science and Technology, okay. the ADA Bayern Award, named one of the top 100 women in Spain, recognized as ACM Distinguished Scientist. I'm not finished, and this is only 2016, okay? So we're very delighted to have her here. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was embarrassing. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Marcel, for the invitation and all of you for coming. Um, so I actually like usually walking, but this is kind of dangerous, so I'll just stay, uh, stay here. So in my talk, I'm going to um, share with you a couple of projects uh, that um, I worked on while I was at Telefonica in the area of modeling human behavior from mobile data. But before I explain the projects, um, I will quickly give an overview of my background so you get a sense of where I'm coming from and uh, what do I mean by uh, modeling human behavior from data. So my, I started my uh, research career um, working on perceptual intelligence. Uh, my dream has always been how to uh, make computers understand people and uh, so they can help us and they can improve our quality of life. 
So I started doing a lot of projects using cameras and microphones and sort of like perceptual sensors and building smart rooms and smart clothes and smart cars and smart uh, offices uh, and so forth. Um, and then back in 2004, I realized that um, the most personal computer was uh, already at the time the mobile phone. And if I wanted to help people and build technology that would understand us, the mobile phone probably was the device that had the biggest chances to do so because it was always with us. And it had increasing computation capabilities and sensing capabilities. So I decided at that time to almost exclusively focus myself on trying to make sense of us, of our behavior, using mobile phone and data collected from mobile phones. So I did some early work on an area called persuasive computing, which in popular terms is called gamification, so how to build technology that help us change a behavior that we want to change. And I did work with uh, early work with wearables before wearables existed, so I had to build my own devices like you see on the top. Um, and then when I moved to Telefonica at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, Telefonica is a very big telecommunications company. They obviously have a lot of mobile uh, data. So I started um, learning and exploring the opportunities of modeling behavior using that kind of data. And that, those are the projects that I will explain today. So in sum, the underlying theme for the past 20 years of my research is how to use machine learning approaches to model individual and aggregate traits and behaviors from a variety of data sources. And I think this is one of the beauties of machine learning. It's a transversal uh, discipline that lets you tackle many different problems you know, from many different perspectives. So we've done work with uh, voice, with images, with sensors, with mobile data, and so forth. So I'll skip all of this. Um, in the context of mobile data, um, this is a summary of all the different areas that um, sort of like I, um, we started working on when uh, I was at Telefonica. Um, at the bottom, you see you can have data, which can be coming either from the mobile network or could be data that you collect through, for example, a user study. And then you have you know, a machine learning module that is making sense of the data, and there are different use cases that you could uh, use it for. On the Except for the left side of the slide, the rest of the slide is about individual modeling. So modeling a specific attributes of an individual. And on the left side, you see aggregate modeling. So you are modeling the behavior of an entire city or of an entire country. So on the individual modeling, we cover five different use cases. And I don't have the time to explain exemplary projects for each of the use cases, so um, if you are interested, we publish a lot, so you can also find all of them in uh, publications. So the first area that we explored was how to build the next generation of business intelligence, where you moved from basic demographics to more sophisticated uh, inferences about people. And one example was a project where we inferred the personality of people from how they were using their phone. You can also think of developing new services that didn't exist before. And one example is developing a credit scoring system that is using uh, data about how you use your phone to infer how financially responsible you are or you are not. And this is a project that uh, I, uh, I could explain later. Uh, we also worked on improving customer service. So most companies have a voice from their customers when they call their customer uh, service uh, lines. Uh, a number of the calls get recorded to be able to better understand what people are, are saying. So we worked not on a speech recognition, because as you probably all know, the state of their speech recognition systems are quite um, good already. But we worked on the paralinguistic elements of speech, so prosody, conversational features, trying to um, understand how things are being said beyond what is being said, because as you know, the how many times is more important than the what. We also uh, worked on personalization and recommendations. Uh, uh, I had a small uh, team of people working on recommendations, and we've done a lot of projects uh, on that topic. And then we also did more exploratory things that maybe weren't so clear, you know, it wasn't so clear what this would be good for. And one example is a project that I can explain later on boredom, on uh, having our phones automatically detect if we are bored or not. Um, in addition, we uh, collaborated in a living lab in Trento together with Telecom Italia, MIT, 
uh, the University of Trento and FBK and us. And that living lab, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called the Mobile Territorial Lab. It, anyone has heard of it? OK, so it's a lab where there's 150 people, volunteers, that carry an instrumented phone um, where they have the free phone and they have free uh, uh, usage of the phone up to a certain limit. And in exchange, they, uh, their data is being collected and it can be used for research purposes. There is a lab whose focus is personal data, understanding from a user-centric perspective what are our sensitivities and uh, our uh, feedback related, related to personal data, mobile personal data. So there we led a project on personal data monetization, where we asked people how much money they thought that their location or their, the fact that they made a phone call or the fact that they took a picture was worth. Because as you know, a lot of this data is being monetized these days, but the question is, do people have a sense of how much money is that worth? So that's a project that I'm not going to present today, but if you're interested, you can find uh, the papers about it. So in all of these, um, and I've already explained this, you know, one of my biggest observations is that you know, mobile phones can be seen as sensors of humans. And why the mobile phone? First of all, because there are more mobile phones in the world than people, and it has uh, very high levels of adoption. It's probably the piece of technology with the highest levels of adoption in our history, uh, between 90% and 120%, according to the ITU. The other important factor is that we love our phones. We carry them with us all the time, and we spend more time with them than with anyone else in our lives. And this is something extremely powerful as the phone becomes more and more powerful. And the other part that is very interesting to me is that this is a global phenomenon. So we are not just talking about developing, developed economies, we're talking also about developing countries. And one of the areas that we worked on, and I would like to present a project today, is an area that we call Big Data for Social Good, where we are looking into the value of large-scale mobile data to help better decisions and have ultimately positive social impact. So I only have 45 minutes, and I wanted to present three projects, but that's, there isn't enough time. So I'm going to make a vote. Uh, these are the three projects that I could present, and I think we need to pick two out of the three. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to quickly explain each project, and then I'll ask for people to raise their hands. The first project that I could present is a project on boredom. It's a project that we did where we uh, tried to answer the question, could my phone know when I'm bored or not? The second project is a project that we did on inferring credit scores from mobile data. And the answer that we wanted to, uh, to the question that we wanted to answer was, could I infer the financial responsibility or how likely a person it is to return a money that they loan from how they use their phone? And the third project is a project in, and this, this project actually can be seen as a project in the area of big data for social good. Um, and the last project also is a project in the area of big data for social good. The first two projects are using individual analysis of people. The last project is using aggregate analysis. And it's a project that we did together with FBK and MIT, where what we did was trying to predict where there was going to be crimes in the metropolitan uh, area of London from uh, mobile network data. OK, so now, please raise your hands, the ones that want to see the boredom project. OK, it's about a third. Hopefully, it's not a third. A third. Uh, uh, what about credit score? OK, so I think boredom is winning. And crime? OK, so crime for sure. So I think I'll do boredom and, 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 uh, boredom and crime. And whoever is interested in credit scores, you can read the paper. I'll, I'll tell you the, the information about the paper. Uh, maybe. <laughs> okay, so this is joint work with Martin Pilot, Tilman Dingler, and, and Jose San Pedro while uh, we were all at Telefonica. And it falls within this right part of the graph that I showed before. And the main two insights for this project is the fact that we spend a lot of time with our phones. And that is what, uh, you know, what enables you know, this project to happen. So all of us are the subjects of a war which is a war for our attention. Um, our attention is being monetized by the different services that we used, a lot of them and most of the time on our mobile phones. And in the past few years, this attention is, uh, has been sort of like grabbed through uh, push notifications on the mobile phone. 
uh, to the degree that you know we receive uh, up, up to 150 notifications a day on our mobile phone. So there has been this deluge of like push-driven notifications, and I think you all of you uh, are, are subjects yeah, and, and understand this. So there's been the concept of the attention economy where human attention is treated as a scarce commodity because indeed there is this competition from all these different services to grab you know, our attention. But our attention obviously is limited, you know, it's not like infinite. And what I think where we are today is in this sort of like wild west land of like trying to grab our attention by all these different competing services uh, in a way that is becoming uh, somewhat out of control and I think we all suffer from that uh, to a certain degree. So the, this is the motivation for this project. We were trying to see how we could help address this issue of having this deluge of notifications you know, uh, attacking us all the time. And the insight that we had was, could boredom be part of the solution? Because while attention, we say, is a scarce resource and our attention is limited, it turns out that it's not always limited. And in fact, by definition, when we are bored, our attention is not limited. Because boredom is an emotional state where we are under-stimulated, and we are actively looking for something to stimulate us. Um, so it's not a person that has nothing to do. It's a person that is actually not sufficiently stimulated. At the same time, and it wasn't just us, previous work had found that mobile phones uh, are a very commonly used tool to kill time when we are bored. And I think you all uh, have seen this, you know, people are waiting in a traffic light and they're with the phone, they're waiting whatever, whatever time, you know, maybe now some of you are like looking at their mobile phone. So we usually go into this pattern of, you know, checking, you know, we check Facebook and then we check email and then we check this other thing and then we go to check some news and then we go back to our original place because we are bored and we're sort of like trying to find something to entertain us. So if my phone knew when I'm killing time like this, maybe it could suggests me a better use of that time. Because in many cases, this cycle that we enter, trying to kill boredom, is not very satisfactory. And if we don't have anything interesting, you know, we go through all these different apps, and at the end, we, we are actually not satisfied. So in order to be able to do this, the first question that we need to answer is, could we detect boredom automatically on the mobile phone? And in order to answer this question, of course, you need to figure out how to do this uh, with from data in a data-driven approach, and you would need some ground truth on whether people are bored or not when they are using their phone. But we didn't have any such ground truth, so we did a user study. Um, so uh, in a user study, what you do is you um, uh, uh, recruit volunteers to um, collect data on whatever topic you're interested in. So in our case, we developed an app called BoreApp, uh, which uh, we put on Google uh, Play, but it is an app that doesn't do anything useful to anyone. It's exclusively a research app, and what it does is it collects uh, all possible uh, information about what you're doing with your phone. Uh, there are some signals that are always collected because they're not very battery intensive, and then there are some um, signals that are only collected when the phone is being used because they uh, consume more battery. And you can see a list of all the uh, sensors that is being collected. And at the same time, Borap uses a technique called experience sampling. Are you familiar with experience sampling? Okay, so experience sampling is a well-known technique used in the human-computer interaction field uh, mainly in user studies, where the idea is our goal is to, to know how people are using their phone and to know whether they are bored or they are not bored. And in the old days, what people did to, to collect data like this was to bring people to a lab. And then they would try to induce boredom maybe on the people or observe the people in the lab. But very quickly we realized that that wasn't a very ecologically valid way of collecting uh, data, in this case about boredom. So a new technique started being used called experience sampling, where the idea is that you probe people in situ, you probe people in their, in their real life multiple times a day, asking them in this case whether they are bored or not, 
with the hope that you are collecting data that is realistic because they are doing, you know, they are just carrying on with their lives and you're asking them multiple times a day. And the idea is that you will be collecting enough samples to have an accurate uh, way to measure uh, whether people are bored or not. So this is what we did with this uh, study. Uh, board app, in addition to collecting all the sensor data uh, of what you're doing with your phone, multiple times a day, it pops up a notification and it asks you whether you're bored or not on a five-point Likert scale. And people had to answer this a minimum of six times per day to successfully complete the user study. And we gave people some incentives to the ones that they finished the user study. So we collected 54 people random people that we didn't know who they were, so they weren't uh, students and they were not our friends. They were people from all over, actually, multiple countries. And for two weeks, they used Borap. And we collected uh, a fair amount of data and, uh, in terms of all the sensor data and also over 4,000 self-reports on whether they were bored or not. When we look at the ground truth, we have one very common challenge in machine learning, which is that you have an unbiased data set because uh, as you see, most of the time, people were not bored. And if we consider a rating of three or a rating of four, meaning you're bored, we only have 10% of the instances of people being bored versus 90% of people not being bored. So what we did also was we normalized the data. We computed the C-score per person to try to make it more even in a way that if the C-score was higher than 0.25, then we consider the person to be bored. And then we got a little bit of a more balanced data set. We computed 35 features in seven different categories. So we had the context, contextual, the context of where the person was, which we, an exemplary feature is the semantic location of where they were, um, which means that we infer from the actual location where was the home, where was the work, et cetera. We had demographics for those who provided them uh, in the study, not everybody provided the demographics. We had information about communication, when was the last time that they talked, intensity of usage, um, usage that was externally triggered, meaning if they were receiving uh, notifications and the, how many notifications they were receiving. Then uh, the apps, the number of apps that they, were, that they had installed and then the apps that they were using. In terms of the modeling approach, so now we had a data set where we have the ground truth of whether people are bored or not and we have all the features on them using their phone. So it's a quite standard machine learning um, challenge from here on. So we used, uh, we tried different supervised machine learning approaches, standard um, approaches, um, like SVMs and logistic regression and gradient booster trees, random forests. Um, we used uh, five-fold cross-validation, and we evaluated the performance using the area under the ROC curve. And we used two ground truths. We used the normalized ground truth, which was a more balanced data set, and the uh, absolute ground truth. And these are the results that we got. So with the absolute grant, we got about 83% of rock, and with the normalized grant, we got a little bit lower, 75%. But we will call this data set the primary data set for a second experiment that we did. So the first take-home message is that uh, we can, with a certain level of accuracy between 75% and 83%, uh, automatically infer if a person is bored or not just by looking at how they are using their phone. But of course, this is not a perfect model at all. So the next question would be, is this actually good for anything? Uh, because maybe you need 100% you know, accuracy, or maybe you only need 10%, you know, maybe this is too good. So to validate, to be able to answer that question, we did a second uh, study, and we made a second app, which we called Board App 2. And this one is actually more useful to people. Um, it is running on the mobile phone, on the mobile phone all the time. It, it has a model of boredom that has been trained using the primary data set, the data set with the normalized ground truth, and it's constantly inferring in the background whether you are bored or not. So all the time it's like logging bored, not bored, bored, not bored, bored, not bored. And then at different times of the day, it suggests you to read a BuzzFeed article. Uh, are you familiar with BuzzFeed? Any of you? So BuzzFeed is sort of like a very popular social news uh, sort of like site where they, they are constantly updating it with like news that are popular in your region or that are interesting and so forth. So Board Up 2 
uh, would like suggest you every once in a while, multiple times a day, you know, are you bored? Maybe you want to read this, and it will be a new BuzzFeed article of the region where the person was. So for this second study, we collected 16 people, which were completely different people from the other people. So we were running mo a model trained on some people, on some other people. Um, and for two weeks, they uh, ran board up two. They, uh, uh, we sent over 900 BuzzFeed recommendations, and about 50% of those recommendations were sent when our system thought that they were bored, and the other 50% when they thought that they were not bored. And the question is, did people behave differently towards the recommendations, depending on whether we thought that they were bored or not, taking into account that we are wrong 20% of the time or 25% of the time. So we measure two variables to understand the value of this boredom inference. The first variable is the click ratio. We wanted to know if people were more likely to click on the recommendation when we thought that they were bored versus not. And this is what we found. We actually found that only 8% of the people clicked on the BuzzFeed recommendation when we thought they were not bored, when compared to 20.5% when we thought that they were bored. And this is a very significant increase in the uh, click ratio. But it's not only clicking. We also wanted to know whether people were actually willing to read what we were recommending. So we also measure what is called the engagement ratio, which, me, which is the fraction of time that people spend more than 30 seconds reading the recommendation. And what we found was that only in 4% of the cases, people did, uh, stayed in the page for more than 30 seconds when they were not bored versus 15% when they were bored. And this difference is also significant. So the second, and to me the most interesting takeaway, is that even with an imperfect model, when we thought people were bored, they were significantly more likely to click on a recommendation, and they were significantly more likely to be engaged with the recommendation and read it. This paper, we published it at UBCOM 2015, and it actually won Best Paper Award, and it was picked up by the press and with MIT Technology Review and different uh, media. So it seems that it's a, a catchy topic. Um, but for us, there are four application scenarios that um, we're interested in exploring. The first one, which is the one that we did in BORAP2, is to recommend content to alleviate boredom. So if my phone knows that I'm bored, maybe it can recommend me interesting things, you know, that uh, it can help me, you know, not be bored anymore. You can also think of reversing and saying, what about shielding me from annoying you know, notifications or from useless you know, notifications when I'm not bored? Because if I'm not bored, maybe you know, I shouldn't be bothered you know, with these unimportant things. So this is another possible application. Another line um, of research that we wanted to look at was, what about recommending not necessarily content, but activities? that you could do while you're bored. For example, imagine you are learning a foreign language. Maybe your phone could suggest you, hey, why don't you practice your words now, you know, because you're bored? Or I don't know, why don't you call your grandmother? You haven't called your grandmother you know, in, in a month or whatever. And finally, which I think uh, might sound controversial, but to me is the most exciting uh, line, would be why not suggest the person to turn the phone off and suggest them to embrace boredom and tell them, look, you're obviously bored. You're not using me for anything useful right now. Maybe you should turn me off and look up. And I think this is something that I don't see that many people working on or doing, but that could be an interesting uh, way of designing technology that is aiming to actually helping us. Uh, because maximizing our use of technology doesn't necessarily help us you know, all the time. These are some of the relevant uh, publications. The ones at the bottom are the relevant to this boredom project, if you are interested in reading all the technical details and more details about it. Um, and now I will talk about the second project, which is the crime project. Uh, actually, let me explain this first. Yeah. Um, so the second project falls within this area of big data for social good where the main idea is if there are more phones than people on the planet, if mobile penetration is so high, particularly in developing economies, could we actually take advantage of these huge amounts of data to help make better decisions in a variety of situations which I'll later explain. So that's the main motivation. So before um, I explain the project, I wanted to give a quick uh, one minute 
background on what kind of data I'm talking about, because I'm talking about mobile data, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not really saying what this data is. So as you all know, the mobile phones connect to a mobile network, which you know, as a very rough approximation, you could imagine that this is what a mobile phone sees. The, the mobile phone sees uh, a geographical space as a network where you know, at the center of, of this Voronoi tessellation, there would be, at the center of its cell, there would be a cell tower. And then as the, mo as the phone moves around, it connects you know, to, dif to different cell towers. The most commonly used type of mobile data that is used in these types of projects is called a CDR. Are you familiar with CDRs? Called detail record, okay. So CDRs were, are created, were created and exist today ex still for billing purposes. And it's a record that is being generated every time the phone makes or receives a phone call or sends or receives an SMS. And they have many fields, but the most commonly used fields for these types of projects are the encrypted originating number, the encrypted destination number, the ID of the cell tower that the phone was connected to. If it's from the same network, you also know the cell tower of the other uh, phone that was connected to, then the timestamp and the duration of the phone call. The spatial granularity of CDRs is not very high because as I showed here, is this, is, but this is by no means uh, GPS uh, accuracy. Uh, you know the ID of the cell tower, and the area of coverage of a cell tower could be between 100 meter by 100 meter to th a few kilometers by a few kilometers, depending on the density of cell towers, which is usually proportional to the density of population. The temporal granularity is also not very good, because this is an event-driven uh, data set. So there is only an event when people use the phone. So if, they, if you don't use the phone, there is no event. So you don't have you know, a regular way of like, knowing what's going on. But still, when, when this data is being aggregated over time and also in space, it becomes useful for some uh, tasks that I will, I will explain later. From this type of data, usually we compute three types of variables or three groups of variables. There is consumption variables, which are variables that capture uh, the overall duration of the phone calls, how many phone calls people make, incoming phone calls, outgo outgoing phone calls, reciprocated phone calls, etc. There are social variables because from knowing the ideas of the different phones that call each other, you can build what is called the call graph, which is a social graph of all the different people that call each other. So then you can uh, use any graph um, sort of like characterization uh, algorithm and, and variables to characterize that call graph and know the in degree, the out degree, the intensity of the connections, uh, etc. And then you can compute some mobility variables because you know the idea of the cell tower, so you can have a rough idea of certain mobility variables like the distance traveled over a certain time period or what is called the radius of gyration or the most popular towers and so forth. So with this type of data, I'll skip the credit scoring one. Um, when you look at it in aggregated form, there is this concept of using the mobile phone as a sensor of human activity. And the interesting thing that I didn't mention is that this data is being generated for every phone, which in developing economies, as you know, the smartphone penetration is still not very high. But because it's for every phone, including feature phones, phones that are very, very simple, then it becomes a tool to understand human behavior on a large scale. And in fact, in 2013, MIT Technology Review named this idea of using this type of data to model be human behavior at large one of the uh, breakthrough technologies of 2013. And as many of you might know, there is this um, emergent field in computer science called computational social sciences, which has ar arisen from the merging of uh, social sciences and uh, computer science, where uh, in the context of mobile, mobile data analysis is one of the areas where a lot of uh, computational social scientists are working on. Because this data enables us for the first time in our history to validate or not certain um, social sciences theories that we had about human behavior, but that we couldn't really validate because we couldn't count you know, how many people migrate from here to there, but now we, we can have a sense. And another important uh, element is actually globally. 
uh, a couple of years ago, United Nations, when they were trying to draft the new uh, sustainable development goals, um, they realized the value of big data for uh, achieving those goals. So they called for a data revolution. They commissioned a report uh, to a few experts on the possibilities and the opportunities that data could bring to uh, United Nations and to achieving all those goals. And then if you look at the 17 sustainable development goals that were uh, released uh, a year ago, they all are very data centric, both in terms of measuring if we're achieving the goal, but also in terms of using data and obviously machine learning to help us achieve the goal. And this is actually the goal, the objective of this area that, um, that I worked on and I created when I was at Telefonica called Big Data for Social Good where we're using this large-scale mobile data to see how we can have positive social impact. We explore four areas, and I will only explain the crime project now. So we explored uh, public health. What is the value of this data? For example, in the, in the case of a pandemic, because we can infer mobility of an entire city or of an entire country. And as you know, mobility is critical to understand the spread of an infectious disease. We use the data for crime, which I'll explain later. We also use this data to understand the impact of natural disasters, for example, earthquakes and floodings. It's very important when a natural disaster happens to have an, uh, an estimation of how many people have been affected, where are the people, have the people been displaced, uh, are they coming back to their homes or not, and all these types of questions we can answer with this type of data. And we also use this data to understand economic development, which is very important in developing economies because, as you know, there is a very big gap between the top of the economic pyramid and the bottom of the economic pyramid. And understanding the socioeconomic status of a region is a proxy of access to education, access to clean water, access to health care, and so forth. And it turns out that you can infer socioeconomic development also using this data. I'll quickly show you a couple of videos so you get a sense of how the data looks like. This, data, this video shows the, these um, white dots that you see are um, proportional to the amount of phone calls that are connected to a cell tower. So on the top, you see a, a very big uh, white dot because that's a city and there is a lot of cell towers there. And this, what the video shows is the activity in the antennas right before, during, and after an earthquake took place in Mexico in 2012. And you see what happens right after the earthquake takes place and why you know, this data is useful. You see there's the epicenter and then there was this big surge in phone calls. So thanks to that big search on phone calls, we, could, we can infer roughly how many people are in the affected areas. So we can help the Red Cross or the government determine how much help to send and where to send it. Another example is this one where you, you get to see large scale mobility. So this is a sample of one million phones in the UK and where you can see you know, uh, the mobility between the different cities. You can see like the, the main uh, roads that connect the cities and so forth. So with this type of data, we did this project on crime. And this was a joint project with FBK and MIT. As you know, crime negatively affects the quality of life of a region where it takes place. And there has been a lot of work exploring the relationships between crime and different socioeconomic variables. In recent years, there has been a change in the way of studying crime because it's been observed that crime tends to concentrate in geographic spaces. Uh, leading to this uh, concept of a crime hotspot. And a lot of the work has been focusing on trying to identify where these crime hotspots are. And I think you all can name you know, which ones are the safest and the least safe areas in your cities you know, or, or where you live. So there is always this sort of like um, concentration of crime in different areas. In terms of social sciences, there have been two theories that have been trying to um, explain the, the characteristics of a city that would make it more prone or less prone to crime. So the first theory is the theory proposed by Jane Jacobs in the 60s. I don't know if you've heard of Jane Jacobs. She was a very popular social scientist and social activist in the US. And she talked about the concept of natural surveillance. And what she said was, well, if a place has a lot of variety of people, a lot of movement, a lot of diversity of people, that place should be safer because we are all acting as uh, policemen to each other and we protect each other. But then about 10 years later, Newman proposed kind of the opposite theory called the defensible space theory, where he was saying, 
Well, if you have a place that has a high mix of people and there's a lot of diversity and there is a lot of people coming in and out, there is more anonymity and then it's more prone to crime because people don't really know each other and we should have communities where everyone knows each other and then if someone, if, if someone is there that they don't know, then they immediately detect it and they will protect each other. And one question is, who is right? Uh, how, do we, how can we know whether one of them is right or not? And I think this is one of the questions that we try to answer with this project. So before I reveal the answer, let me ask you. So who thinks Jane Jacobs was right? Raise your hand. OK, maybe 10% of the people. Who thinks Newman was right? OK, maybe 20%. Uh, the other ones have their own theory, I guess. Uh, um, anyway, so I'll tell you later what happens. So in this project, we, as I explained, we have a place-centric approach, not a people-centric approach. So we are not trying to figure out if an individual is going to commit a crime. We're trying to figure out if a certain neighborhood is going to, to be a crime hotspot or not. And it is data-driven, obviously. Uh, it uses multiple sources of data that I will explain next. Uh, the city of a study is the metropolitan area of London. And I don't know what happened there. Uh, and I will explain the data now. So we use three different data sets. This project was actually the winning project of a data stone for social good that Telefonica organized together with the campus party in London a couple of years ago. And as part of that data thon, multiple data sets were shared with the scientific and, and research community and which, with whoever team you know, wanted to register for this uh, competition. So the three data sets that were used in this project was the Smart Steps data set, the Criminal Cases data set, and the London Borough Profiles data set. So the Smart Steps data set is a data set coming from the mobile network. It is similar to what I just explained, but it's coming from a product that Telefonica um, has in the UK, where instead of having a Voronoi tessellation, you have a square grid. And then for each of the squares in this grid, the teams were given for each of these cells and for each hour an estimation of how many people were in that cell, an estimation of the percentage of, for those people, which percentage this was their home, this was their work, or they were just visiting. And then a market research company provided for that cell also a gender split and the age splits in, in, in brackets of 10 years. Obviously, from the mobile, from the activity in the cell towers, you don't know neither the gender nor the age, but this market research company was providing those estimations because that's what they do uh, in their job. The other data set was the crime data, which would be the ground truth. This crime data was shared from the London police as part of, because one of the collaborators for this data fund was the Open Data Institute. And it had the crime geolocation for two months. And we used one month for training and the other one month for testing. It had all the crimes in the UK, but we only used the crimes in the London's metropolitan area. To define a hotspot, we uh, computed the median value per uh, region. And it was five. So if there were more than five crimes, it would be a hotspot in that month. Otherwise, it wouldn't. And the spatial granularity is what is called the LSOA, which is the granularity used by the British census. And I'll show you uh, how it looks like. And the definition is, it's a geographic area that has a mean population of 1,500. And this is how, how they look, the different LSOAs for the um, uh, London metropolitan area. So we had to map the square grid of the mobile network data with these irregular shaped LSOAs, but it's not a very uh, hard thing to do. In addition, we had 68 metrics, which were quite detailed metrics coming from the census, which is called the London Borough Profiles. And this is computed every 10 to 12 years. It's extremely expensive to compute, but it's quite detailed. And it has information about the demographics, the income, the unemployment levels, the life expectancy, the happiness levels, the house prices, etc. So it's very detailed census information. There were 68 variables for each of these LSOAs. So, the first step from the mobile data was to compute features from this uh, uh, estimation of how many people were there. So we computed all sorts of uh, statistics on these features, first order features and second order features. Um, I, I, it is important to understand that this type of data is spatial temporal data. So one of the questions is you don't know what is the right temporal representation that matters for the problem at hand. 
So we computed features aggregating in different time scales. So every hour, uh, then morning, evening, night, then weekdays versus weekends, et cetera. So at the end, we ended up with like 6,000 features, and we used a, a state-of-the-art feature selection algorithm to reduce the dimensionality to 68 features, which was the same dimensionality as the census data, because we had seen 68 census variables. So in such a way that we could build uh, three models. We could build a model that was using the 68 smart steps data, a model that was using the 68 census data, and a model that was using 68 features from the combination of both the mobile data and the census data. It is a binary classification task because we want to know whether a certain LSOA is going to be a crime hotspot or not. We use tenfold cross-validation and we use random forests as the classifier because they were performing better than, than any other classifier. And this is what we got. Um, surprisingly, at least to us, the, the model that was only using the mobile data, the smart steps data, performed better than the model that was using the very detailed census data. And then when we combined both of them, we got almost 70% um, accuracy in, in the models. Um, this picture shows the ground truth versus the inference, the predictions, but it's impossible to actually uh, see much there. But in order to answer the questions of who was right, Jane Jacobs or, or, or Newman, let's look at the most relevant features. And that's when I reveal who, you know, who was right of you guys. Um, in terms of the temporal granularity, we found that the features that were encoding the daily dynamics were the most predictive, as opposed to monthly, weekly, hourly, etc. We also found that features related to uh, a high number of residents were uh, correlated with more crime. So we found that the higher the ratio of residents, the more crime we found, which was supporting Jane Jacobs, and it was in contrast to Newman's thesis. And in addition, we found a lot of entropy-related features uh, being selected in the final model. And entropy measures how uh, predictable a variable is. And in a sense, it could be interpreted as uh, Jane Jacobs' idea of diversity being supported by the fact that entropy features seem to be also correlated with lower uh, levels of crime. Another interesting finding is that when we had the joint model using both mobile data and census data, only six out of the 68 features were coming from the census, and 62 features were coming from the mobile information. So it seems that while the census information is very detailed, because it's usually obsolete, because you only compute the census every 10 to 12 years, it becomes less important for this particular problem than more up-to-date information, even though the information is not very detailed, because the only thing you know is an estimation on the number of people and so forth. Um, so um, these are some of the relevant uh, publications about this uh, project. And I think the main conclusion and what really motivates my work in all the projects that I've done is that mobile phones have huge potential to help us, to help us both individually by understanding us and then doing, you know, helping us in doing something better or, or in the case of boredom, for example, helping us deal better with boredom but also in aggregate form. They can help us make better decisions to, uh, in the case of a pandemic or in the case of a natural disaster you know, or in the case of crime. So my encouragement to you would be to think about how you know, using machine learning and whatever data you, know, you have, we can actually, all of us, contribute to having this positive impact in the world. Thank you. That's it. Okay, thanks very much. I know there are many questions.